Hello, and welcome back to The Hatch. I'm Sammy Roth. I'm Rosie Murphy, and this is the podcast where we talk about Lost. We've got a real highlight this week of the sixth season. It is episode 11, Happily Ever After, and it is, of course, the Desmond episode. You will remember this as the flash sideways where Desmond is working for Charles Widmore rather than against him. Eloise is back. Daniel is back. There is lots to talk about. And we've got Henry Ian Cusick, Desmond himself, back on the podcast for the third time talking about it with us. Can't wait. Let's get started. We've got a couple of uh, listener hot takes to start with this week, right? We sure do. We will start off with one about an episode we watched uh, a few weeks back, The Lighthouse. Hello. I'm calling to leave a hot take. Um, I believe that you're correct. Jack is very angry, um, and he doesn't have the answers when he smashes the lighthouse mirrors. But I think a lot of it comes from this idea of fate and free will. So when he sees his name and the other names on the wheel and he sees his childhood home, there's this realization that it was fate that brought him to the island or that Jacob brought him here. And and that really is part of his whole struggle between fate and free will. And perhaps in that moment, he realizes that he didn't um, have all the choices he made in his life as freely as he made them, that he was destined to come there. Um, and this kind of connects with this whole realization or this whole um, beginning to understand his dad and accept his dad, because that goes back again to the whole Red Sox will never win the World Series, and his father kind of chalked things up to fate and didn't take responsibility uh, for his actions, at least in Jack's mind. So um, the idea of his name being there and his house being watched, it was always supposed to happen this way. So that's a real struggle for Jack. And again, it's a crack in that whole idea of who he thought his father was or what he thought um, he needed to do in his life. I think this is a fascinating way to look at what happens to Jack in the lighthouse, right? This idea that what he's realizing there is that he thought he had free will. He thought he could be a man of science and make all these choices and, and be the architect of his own life. And he couldn't, actually. He wasn't. Jacob was there the whole time you know, pulling on on various threads. And I really like the way this caller connects it to Christian's approach, which is sort of more likely to talk, chalk things up to fate and to be hands off. And that maybe that was one of the things that Jack sort of couldn't stand about his father. I think that's fascinating. I, I do too. And I mean, the the phrasing that our, the caller used, and, and thank you to, to her for sending this in, that, that Christian chalks things up to fate and doesn't take responsibility for his actions. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and it reminds me as well of him telling Jack, you know, you just don't have what it takes as if that's something out of Jack's control entirely. Totally. As if, cause, cause Jack's attitude, I think responding to that is she, I think this is the implication here is, well, what do, what do you mean? I don't have what it takes. I decide whether I have what it takes. Mm -hmm. I can, I can change me. I can change events around me if I so choose. So I, I love the idea here that one of the reasons Jack is so strongly a man of science and, and so, you know, in such a deep place rejects the idea of of fate and of uh, of faith is that it's a reaction to his father and who his father told him he was. Yeah. And to find out that he was wrong. I mean, there, there quite literally was somebody orchestrating certain events in his life. And he, there were choices he could not make that he thought he was making. And frankly, the whole Jacob controlling events and fate thing, I'm going to have some, some more negative comments about in a few minutes here as we get into the events of Happily Ever After, but it's certainly interesting to watch Jack go through it. Um, we have one more listener hot take as well, and this is uh, this is from our listener, Dave. Yeah, hi, this is Dave. I've got a couple of hot takes on the parents we all love to hate. First one is Ben, who I, is responsible for Alex's death, but I don't think it's the, uh, because he wouldn't give himself up. I think Ben understood that the rules wouldn't allow his daughter to be killed. But when Kimi points his gun at her, Ben disowns her. He says she's not his daughter. She means nothing to him. Well, if she's not his daughter, the rules no longer apply. Bye, Alex. The other one is about Eloise. Excuse me, about Eloise, who was right to send Daniel back to the island. 
Remember, the Daniel that she sent back was a guy whose mind had crumbled so badly that he needed a caretaker, not this vibrant, quirky guy that we saw most of the time during the show. I bet he would leap at the chance to reclaim his brilliance and maybe save the world instead of living another 40 years as a shell of himself. Anyway, those are my two takes. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah, two two really good points here. I mean, we'll yeah. we'll have more on Eloise and Daniel this episode, but I... Uh, I definitely appreciate the thought that maybe it's not as terrible as we made it out to be that Eloise sent her son back to the island and, you know, even if if she knew he was going to die, gave him at least one last chance to sort of be his brilliant self and do the things that he loved to do in life, that the physics and the experimentation and the sort of adventure that he goes on, that that's not something he ever would have had otherwise. Um, also liked the, I don't know that I liked, but it was an interesting idea about Ben, sort of that the disowning of Alex was what allowed her to be killed because... Um, because the rules said that Ben's daughter couldn't be killed, but if she's not his daughter, then then it's okay. I, I don't know if that's right or not, or if I agree with it, but it's interesting. And if it's true, my question would be, why is that not still Ben's fault for not, uh, not knowing the rules well enough that, uh, that he knew that was going to happen? But anyway, it's, it's intriguing. I like, I like this a lot. And I will be thinking about the idea that Eloise sending Daniel back to the island may have had a little bit of mercy in it and a little bit of generosity and wasn't entirely like this mercenary action, right? Just to keep the train on the tracks. Still sort of was because she, she knew what the outcome was going to be, but there was meaning in that too. I I agree. And and yeah. maybe, you know, I don't think we see that in her. So it requires a little bit of a, a leap of faith here to believe that she has that within her. But, but I, I, I kind of like that idea that she does, especially after seeing her in happily ever after this week, where clearly she's, She's learned some things and, you know, she, you know, she's realized like, oh, having this quality time with my son that I never had, you know, that's what really matters. And I wish I had that time before, you know, she'll say later in the season, don't, you know, you're not here to take him away from me, are you? Um, So maybe that was within her all along. And she, you know, she knew it at some level in life. before death. Before we get too far down that track, Sammy, what is your hot take about Happily Ever After? I want to, you know, as as always, and I apologize for being a broken record, just continue a little bit on my, my hobby horse here. I think my hot take this week is just fuck the island. Hmm. Um, you know, the stuff that happens with Desmond where, you know, Widmore is, is reading him the riot act about why he brought him back here. He says, I didn't have, you know... I didn't have a chance to explain, you know, why you needed to come back here and why I needed to take you away from your family. But if I had, you never would have come with me. I can't imagine how you must be feeling. It's like, no fucking shit. You can't imagine how he must be feeling. And then the whole the whole speech about, uh, I'm going to ask you to make a sacrifice and I hope you'll help me. The island isn't done with you yet. Uh, everyone is, is going to die if, uh, you know, that we care is going to die if you don't do these things. It's like, just let... Uh, it's so unfair to Desmond. Like that's a that's an understatement of, of mm-hmm. the nth degree to say it's so unfair. He he worked so hard to get away from here to get back to the woman he loves. They've had a son together, and to have that all just pulled away from him for for the sake of the island because this is you know what Jacob demanded of Widmore. I mean, this gets back to my problem about the idea of God. Any God that is demanding these things and inflicting this kind of cruelty upon people for whatever, some kind of greater good, I, I just, I, I, I have, it's absolutely impossible for me to believe that this this serves a greater good or that it's worthwhile to serve whatever purpose by doing this to this person. It's just, fuck the island, fuck Jacob. I, I, I can't, I mean, it makes for a great story. Don't get me, I'm not complaining about the show, but... um if if the island is is god then you know this is uh, then let's 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 be better let's we do better without god is what i'm saying yeah the desmond thing is such a bummer because they they treat him like a tool they treat him like a part for a machine and it's like our machine is broken we have to go get this part but that part is a person who has a family and a life outside of this and it doesn't matter. It's just that we need to take him so that we can plug him in so that our machine works properly. And that's not what people are. No. But that's how the island treats them. 
That's um, you said that so so well. I agree with that completely. And it's not obviously it's not just Desmond, the island, and Jacob, and the man in mm-hmm. black treat just about everyone like it's this. It's what happens to the candidates too. But well, and Jacob always insists that he gives people choices. No, where's the choice for Des? I mean, this puts the lie to it. I mean, <clears throat> Whitmore says it straight out, and he's acting on Jacob's orders here. You know, if, if I had had. You know, if I if I had had the chance to explain, you know, it wouldn't have mattered because you wouldn't have come with me anyway. So I had to just do this. Desmond never in a thousand years would have made this choice. A hundred percent. No. And 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 there's you know, and you're right. People are not just tools. And there's there's a proverb of some kind in Judaism that just came to my mind that I really love, which which is basically the effect of to save a single life is like saving the whole world, mm. um, because that is the value that is within each of us as an individual. Yeah. And so the idea that, I mean. I mean, ultimately, Desmond's life is not sacrificed here, but it it very easily could have been if Widmore was wrong. And the idea that to sacrifice his life and to sacrifice what's making him happy for the sake of the greater world, it just, it rings so hollow to me. You're right. A human life is so much, is so much more than that and has so much more value than these, these powerful forces give us all credit for. Yeah. And, and one more thought. We had a couple of listeners write in on, on Twitter and in various places and, and make, basically make a similar point. You know, we were talking last week about our skepticism that if the man in black were allowed to get off the island, that, you know, everyone would, would be dead or the world would end. And, you know, I was, I was skeptical about that and you were trying to interpret it a little bit more metaphorically, I think. Mm-hmm. But, but several folks said, well, really what this is about is the light at the heart of the island, that if that goes out and the man in black is allowed to put that out, then that special spark that makes us all human um, you know, that goes out everywhere for everyone and, and reality and goodness as we know it. And because that light is out hmm. and, and my thought about that uh, is, you know, similarly heretical to all this other stuff I've been saying, which is that I, I, I just don't, I just have trouble believing that we're, we're dependent upon some outside power or force for that, you know, special spark within us that makes us human and gives us the instinct to want to be good to others. Like, hmm. I, I think that's, that's within us and not dependent on, I want to believe that that is not dependent on some outside force or power, this special light. It just, it bothers me at a really deep level. And I think it's, I think it's related to this whole conversation about what is the greater good and what is worth sacrificing for that. I I, I just, that whole concept is, is anathema to me. Anathema, I can't pronounce that word properly. Anyway. You and Jack should talk. That's my hot take. Yeah, me and Jack should talk. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) What do you got? Give me your hot take. So this is the the second episode in three weeks where we have spent the majority of the episode in the sideways and like continuously in the sideways. Abaterno, it's almost the it's almost the entire episode with beginning and end on the island. Happily ever after, we cut away to the island once during the flash sideways. But I think it just works so well. Like it allows us to really become immersed in this other place and this other Desmond and this other reality. And it had me wishing that they had done the whole season that way. Like what if, you know, recon Sawyer's flash sideways that we both really love. What if we had spent 20 minutes in that place with that Sawyer and that miles and that Charlotte really taking all of that in. And I don't know. I just think it would have been cool. And we could have done these like 15 little short films rather than, you know, taking as a counterpoint, um, the package last week, which is there are moments of real beauty in Sun and Jin's story in that flash sideways. And then they just kind of, it's almost like we're cutting off that story in order to go back to the island, which uh, the sideways is just way more compelling to me because it's different. And it's this fascinating thought experiment. And obviously I'm, I have the luxury of knowing how the story ends. So I don't need to be invested in like every moment of action on the island, but had me wishing that that had been an option. I think it might've been cool. I like that thought. I part of me wonders if if the that sort of strategy would have lost its effectiveness if they had done yeah. it again and again. But I, but overall, I, I think I'm with you, and I I think you're you're right to identify that some of the stories on the island and Recon is a pretty good example. Not that there aren't good scenes on their own, but it it feels like a lot of the island story they're they're sort of spinning their wheels this year, like they know where they're going and they're coming up with these you know like little side plots of, you yeah. know, Locke sends so-and-so to the other island or sends them back and they're all spying on each other and, you know, Jin is getting kidnapped. Like, it it, it kind of seems like they're trying to fill the space a little It just space feels a little, a little convoluted. 
Yeah. Yeah. It is. And, and we'll get to this in the, the Ian Cusick interview, but like, you know, the throwing of Desmond in the well in a couple of weeks, he, <laughs> he says that's the point where he calls the writers and, and says, uh, you guys need to tell me what's going on here. I'm so confused. And it's, and it's fair. It's, it, it's fair. Um, yeah. Where, yeah, I, th- I think what you're saying speaks to the fact that ultimately the strongest part of most of the season is the sideways and just the uniqueness of that story they're telling there and how it reflects on what's come before. So yeah, I think I think I'm with you. I could have used yeah. more of that. And I wonder if they could achieved, you know, moving the plot forward on the island with only like 15 minutes per episode, you know, three, there's still multiple scenes, right? Like, Abiturno is a good example. There's still multiple scenes and you see multiple groups of people, but like just might've been, I think we could have accomplished the same thing. I'm I'm with you. This this is an amazing flash sideways. I mean, yes. I, I, frankly, I also feel like thematically this could be lost, you know, like thesis statement or dissertation on the message it's trying to give us about life, but it's, it's wonderfully, wonderfully done. Say more. Well, just the whole, I mean, the whole idea here, I think, is that, you know, it's about what really matters in life, right? Yeah. And I mean, the whole, the whole thing, and they, they, they hit it, you know, really nail on the, you know, head again and again. But Desmond is told, you have everything you want. You have a great job. You have the respect of, of your, of your boss and you have no commitments and no attachments and you can travel the world. And it, I mean, and we all know as we're watching this, we can feel it right away and we can feel within Desmond that we know that deep down he knows it's not right either. But, what matters is love and, and yeah. the people you care about and the, you know, the, the true deep connections that you form with others along the way. And so, I mean, I, I just feel like that's what, you know, that's what the finale is about and that's what Lost is, is sort of saying all along, but it's, um, it, it just, it, it plays out in a really intriguing way here, I think. Yeah. I love the scenes between Desmond and Charlie. Same. I think they do so much. And, you know, you have Charlie who is, maximally sincere like as sincere as it is possible to be when he's talking about his vision on the airplane and this consciousness altering love that he felt and i love that phrase consciousness oh altering love in, in as a foil to that you have desmond who is just like seems just just distant and kind of glazed over and comes across as just like ever so slightly insincere and i don't think we would pick up on it if we didn't have charlie grounding us in like this is what honesty looks like this is what sincerity looks like and then because desmond comes off as perfectly nice and capable and functional and maybe happy but it it just seems so shallow and it seems like if you like peeled off this mask there would just be nothing there Mm. you know and it's it's played so effectively because it's so different from the desmond we know but the difference is so slight i just love it I, i i I, I like the idea that the you know Charlie is there to sort of reveal what is missing from Desmond and to ground us in his authenticity. I I, I think you couldn't be more more right about that. I, I love the bar scene. One one line that I thought was one of the few places where this ep- and this is not a complaint, but one of the few places where the episode made that point with a little more subtlety and a little more you know like less hitting you over the head with it was when. When Charlie's song, you know, you all, everybody starts to play in the car. Yeah. And Charlie says to Desmond, That's my band. Drive Chef. Our first single. The beginning of everything great. And there's this just like sardonic note in his voice where you can you can tell what he really feels is like, this didn't really matter that much. And I think it just gets back to, you know, the whole professional success and achieving your highest aspirations. Like that is, you know, that's not actually what it's all about. And and Charlie has learned to recognize, and it's an interesting contrast to his, you know, his his quote unquote previous life or when he was really alive. Where, where I mean, one of his greatest memories was the first time he heard himself on the radio. Yeah. And not that that's not great, but you know, it's it's not everything. And I yeah. think he really recognizes that here. Um, it is pretty shocking and a great great sequence when he grabs the wheel and sends them into the water. Yeah, and it it of course sets us up for that great scene where Charlie gets to press his hand against the glass and Desmond. Wake, has that moment of awakening, right? Where he has, he flashes the other way back onto the island and, and realizes that there is something else. It's, um, it, it's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. And it, it doesn't come off as too heavy handed or anything like that. I think it is super, super well done. Heavy handed? Uh, 
Sorry. <laughs> hey. No, and 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 Dom- Dominic Monaghan. I love how he plays it, where you think he's like knocked out under the water, and finally, yeah. he's like his eyes are closed, just sitting there, totally still. And when Desmond shows up, he just very casually opens his eyes, like it's no big thing turns to the side, presses the hand, and then he just closes his eyes back again like he's ready to go. Like, it's it's so, I mean, it's it's kind of bone-chilling. Um, it's yeah. Really I interpreted that as Charlie having a flash there. I mean, we oh. see when Desmond is in the stadium later when he meets Penny, she says that he faints when he flashes back onto the island. Oh, interesting. And I wonder if Charlie is kind of, like, blacking out while he's in the other place and then he comes back and that's how he knows to give the message to Desmond in that way or something. I, I like that. I like that interpretation. Yeah. What what else stood out to you? What was on your mind watching this? What a bummer it is that Desmond's emergency contact is his boss. <laughs> I had that note too. I thought that was just a great detail. <laughs> yeah. He didn't even write down an emergency contact. He's got no one. And when they ask yeah. him, it's like, uh, I guess my boss. Yeah. The other, the other great callback in that scene is when the, the MRI tech refers to the button, and Desmond's like, what button? You, know, you can tell his brain recognizes something there. Yeah. One scene near the beginning that I think just speaks to the fact that deep down there's this other Desmond who does not really believe that, you know, this is all that matters, that this moment with Claire in the airport. Yeah. When, you know, with, with no obligation upon him, he shows that kindness to her of offering her a ride and you know, asking her, is it a boy or, I mean, it's a little intrusive, the boy or a girl, but it leads to the very nice moment of a boy. I bet it's a boy. And mm-hmm. he knows there's more to it than what he has in this life, even if he's not ready to admit it to himself. And what Charlie does is I think he gets him to admit it to himself. Yeah. What do we think of the, the idea that the thing that wakes up Charlie, as well as Desmond, as well as Daniel, is this notion of like true love? I'm interested in the idea that like love is the thing that can can shake you so deeply that it makes you realize that you know it can kind of take you out of your mind in that real way but I also don't know that the show's thesis is that like everyone has a soulmate and that seems like a little bit where we're going. Yeah, I that's a very good point and I feel like I've I've perhaps inadvertently implied that that's that that's the, well, 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 what do you what do you think? I I have some assorted ideas but it sounds like you you're honing in on something here. Personally, I don't like the idea that there is a soulmate and that that is the most important thing for everyone. But it's very beautiful that it's the most important thing for Desmond. I, I agree with you. I know. And I, I think that definitely like the show is not saying it's it's the only thing for everyone. And I mean, yeah, clearly it's the case for Desmond. I, I think in every reality, Desmond and Penny are together. I would say probably the same about Jin and Son. Maybe the operative phrase in consciousness altering love is not love, but consciousness altering right like maybe Mm. the thing that really wakes them up is like the experience of the most powerful emotion they ever felt fuck that's good like what charlie describes is is seeing claire and we know because when he in greatest hits right when he writes out the most important moments of his life the most important is when he met claire and that was presumably like the the thing that altered his consciousness the most. And maybe that's the key is like, it takes a glimpse of that really, really overwhelming life changing feeling to, to snap you back. Right. And to make you realize what, what's important and what's not important. That feeling was the important thing and whatever caused that feeling and whatever brought that out in you that's what matters the most and i think part of what we see in this episode with desmond this idea that he's a little bit insincere that there's not a lot under the surface is that he has never experienced anything like that before anything approaching that and something about this encounter with charlie telling him that there's more giving him this very specific name it almost like primes him to be awakened in whatever um and then when he meets Penny, he's open to that and it 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 hits him, right? And he's like, oh, there's this whole deeper level, to, you know, to my consciousness or to what I can experience or the depth of the human experience or, or whatever that I've just never tapped into before. And now I'm oper- – it's almost like he's operating on a higher plane, right? It's like he had been down here in base level reality, life is my job and, you know – 
making money and having sex and whatever else he talks about. And now he's operating up here. He's like leveled up to like life is love and commitment and, and whatever else. And I think maybe that is the distinction. I, I think you've hit the nail completely on the head. I loved how you, how to say that, that it was really it's consciousness altering. It's about whatever was the strongest feeling you ever had or the strongest emotion yeah. you ever felt or the thing that was the most powerful for you to experience. And what what that brought to mind right away outside of the realm of romantic love is Locke. Mm. I, I mean, we, we I said Locke's in the church on his own at the end, but what wakes him up is Jack, you know, feeling his movement in his right. legs again after surgery and, and recalling the moment when he woke up on the island and he could wiggle his toes. That's the oh, callback. Good call. And, and that's the most powerful feeling Locke ever experienced probably. And that's what alters his consciousness. Wow. wow we're on to something here. I, I think so. And I, I think with Jack as well, um, I'm going to, you know, go back a little bit to that hot take. We, we talked about earlier about lighthouse and, you know, yes, maybe, um, you know, it's maybe part of the reason why this is why Jack is the last holdout at the end. And it's so hard for him to accept this consciousness altering experience is that for him, you know, it's something that is out of his control. Mm. You know, Jack's, Jack's whole thing, you know, faith versus free will, science versus faith. In a lot of ways, I think it's really about control and him being able to control what he what he does and the outcome of events and how he feels about and responds to things. And this idea that he has to let in this outside force, whatever it is that's going to alter his consciousness, that's sort of beyond the realm of his own just, uh, you know, choice and ability to say, yes, I'm going to feel this or no, I'm not going to feel this. Um, that is really hard for him to accept and I think fits in nicely with how you've conceptualized what's going on here. I think that makes a lot of sense. Because a, a lot of this for all of them, it's about, I mean, Jack has it the hardest, but I, I think there is a lot strong element here of giving up control and accepting that accepting that there's some force in your life, some feeling or emotion or experience that's just going to, you know, letting it in and letting it overwhelm you and do its thing. I mean, and maybe that's love and maybe it's something else, but it's, I, I think we all probably need that, or at least that's what the show is telling us. Mm. Something that, something that's going to help us level up that we maybe couldn't just do on our own by choice. This is based in nothing, but it's season six. Okay. We got to, we got to put all our cards on the table. What if that is what the light at the heart of the island is about? Like a flash of brilliance. Mm. Like that's, maybe that's the, this idea of like, if that is the thing that makes us human, maybe it's not about morality or ethics, but maybe it's sort of the source of that alteration of consciousness that gives us, that animates us, that gives us the inspiration to go out and do things that are not normal <laughs> or, you know, that are kind of beyond the bounds of selfishness and yeah, and the, the lives that we sort of construct for ourselves in the way that Desmond has here. Well, if I'm going to agree to that, I'm going to have to eat my words about how we don't need any outside force. The way I should phrase it is, does that make you feel better? Is that a better interpretation for you of what the heart of the island might A little be? bit, actually. Yeah, a little bit. Rather than it being the thing that puts goodness into the universe or that, you know, gives life meaning, maybe it could be the thing that, the thing that inspires us or the thing that helps us get outside of ourselves. Yeah, and maybe if that goes out, you just have a bunch of Desmond working for Charles Widmore's, like... They're not unhappy. They're fine. They're not bad people. They can be nice to a pregnant woman at an airport, but they're not, they haven't, they're not able to level up, quote unquote. I wish I had a better phrase for that, but it works. Yeah, level up. I mean, I, I just, a minute ago, I found myself using the word inspire, and I feel like maybe that's a helpful way, at least for me, to think about it. Yeah. There's a, a book that, um, C.S. Lewis wrote that is widely considered to be a conception of hell, and it's called The Great Divorce. And it's been probably 15 years since I read this, so I apologize if this is wrong. But my memory of it is the the people who live in quote unquote hell all just like live in this city and have pretty normal but kind of shitty lives, but shitty in like very pedestrian ways. Like they live with a family member who they can't stand and they just can't get along or they have this like job that brings them no meaning or whatever. And then every day there's a bus that comes and you can choose to get on the bus, but you don't know where it's going. And if you get on, you can never come back. And that bus takes you out of this hell place and toward this heaven place. And you sort of have to go through lots of 
difficult things in order to to reach heaven, but you've you've chosen to go that way. Um, and maybe that's kind of a purgatory space. Um, but th- that conception of hell is maybe kind of what we're talking about if the man in black succeeds in his mission is like, just kind of boring, pedestrian, meaningless life. Not torture, not natural disaster, not any of that stuff we talked about in the package. Like, what what are the stakes here, really? Maybe it's just all of that bigger stuff goes away. And we're all just Desmond making a lot of money, <laughs> but not having meaning. Yeah. That's really interesting. And, you know, one one thing I, I think we should throw in here, I mean, he's, you know, happy-ish at a basic level, but also, like, clearly Widmore doesn't give a shit about him. Oh, 100%. Like, Widmore is happy as long as he's doing a job, but as soon as he loses Charlie, Widmore is, you know... What do you mean he's gone? Look, he escaped. He knocked over a doctor with a bloody crash car and then ran out of the hospital. And you let him go? He's a junkie who drove my car into the ocean, Charles. I'm fine, by the way. Thanks for asking so he, um, I mean, I think, I think that, so I think the C.S. Lewis comparison that you make is a, is, is a, I mean, I've never read that book, but it sounds like a pretty yeah. good reference point for this of what Desmond's yeah. life is like. Yeah. I like that. I can live with that. I can live with that. Yeah. I, I think I sort of can. In that case, it's like though, I, I mean, that, that creates an argument for, okay, here's why it's acceptable for Jacob to do the things he do, does right. to protect that. But, but also frankly, I don't, I don't think as we've, as you know, I've, I've, screamed about in past weeks i i think that jacob is really motivated by something much more uh much more self-centered and and you know kind of venal yeah personal that's a grudge vendetta against his brother and frankly i if that really is what the light is and and we're basing that off of our own interpretation here of events in a way that works Mm -hmm. for us which is good that's what lost is all about i don't think jacob really understands what the light is for like Jacob is going, I mean, we see it in Across the Sea. It's based on some real vague comments that, you know, his not, his murderous not mother says to him about why you need to protect this. And so I, I, I still have trouble with all the stuff Jacob does because I just don't think it's really, uh, motivated by, by anything particularly good. And I don't think he really knows what he's protecting if, if it is anything like what we're describing. Well, have Jacob and the man in black ever experienced this consciousness altering feeling. I don't think we have any sense that they have and they're not quite human. So there's always a bit of an asterisk by that, I think, but what would it take to wake Jacob up? What would it take to wake the man in black up? Like, I don't know if that's possible because they're not, they are these sort of other types of beings or something, but maybe that's why, this is able to be such like a petty personal fight because the stakes, if, if that is what the stakes are. And again, we just made this up. (laughs) um, They have no understanding of the stakes because they have no experience of that deep, deep goodness. That's really, really interesting. They don't understand the stakes. I think if they had experienced that deep, deep goodness, you know, maybe the man in black is too far gone, but I'd like to think that Jacob wouldn't be willing to put people through what he's putting them through, sacrificing some people for the greater good of, you know, everyone. But I don't know. I, 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 this doesn't resolve for me the problem of, you know, fuck the island, fuck Jacob, where I started this week. Right. But I, I, I like where you've brought us to about why the light might be important and what it could symbolize that's really positive. Um, yeah. I like that. Again, made that up out of thin air today. So <laughs> I, I don't think that that's canon, but uh, one way to read the text. That's what's we'll great about Lost. See if it holds up. That's what's great about Lost. And to our listeners, we have only six weeks left of this, which is oh very, goodness. very sad. Um, if you have your own ideas about what makes the light important, or if you want to vociferously agree or disagree with us, um, call and leave us a hot take, please. 9546 Dharma is the number. The other thing off island that I want to talk about is Eloise, who I think is so interesting. She very clearly is already awake. She knows what's going on here. Um, And even in this timeline, her job is to keep Desmond like on course, which is so interesting. But on the course he's currently on of working for Widmore, right? She, She tries very hard to keep him from finding anything out about Penny. She tells him to stop looking. What is going on here? 
Well, I mean, I think we get an explanation for it. I believe in the finale when at, at the concert, when she asks Desmond with, you know, looking at tears in her eyes, basically like, are you here to take my son away from me? Mm. And Desmond says, no, it's not his time yet. So, I mean, I think she's, yeah. she's figured out what's going on and she's using it as this opportunity to, you know, have this quality time with Daniel that she was never able to have in life. And she knows that when that, you know, that ends, it's kind of over forever. So to, to you know, to me, this is making up for her mistakes in life and trying to have that time with Daniel um, I do think that on the, the consciousness altering point that probably it was probably it was some moment with Daniel that mm. that sort of brought her brought her to re, that altered her consciousness or made her remember. I mean, it's clearly she doesn't have a true love thing going on with Charles Widmore here. Um, I think it's the relationship with her son that probably did that for her. Would be my yeah. guess based on our, our conversation thus far. So after all of this transpires in in the sideways we come back to the island desmond wakes up you know physically fine and it's so interesting to watch the the performance here because in this this other desmond is like also a little bit disengaged kind of in the way that sideways desmond is but not quite like he, he comes off as much more sincere he comes off as like disengaged from a place of like very deep peace and security and like I know exactly what I need to do and I am 1000% okay with it. And I am, you know, I sort of have blinders on and I'm focused on that. And it's just, again, such a dramatic contrast to what's happening in the sideways, but also kind of similar in interesting ways. And what do you think changed for Desmond between when he went into the electromagnetic chamber and when he woke back up? Is it just a realization that this place is that important and he does have to help protect it because no, I think it's the opposite. Um, yeah. I mean, we, we actually, as I recall, get an explanation for this later where Desmond a few times makes comments to the effect of like, well, don't you understand? Like none of this matters. Like there's this other mm. place where we're all happy and can be with the ones we love. Like right, I, I don't right, actually right. think Desmond knows what he's supposed to do or has any you know idea what's going on here. I, I think he's just, you know, like, Oh, well I don't have to give a shit about this anymore. Like I can kind of cruise through this because you know, I know that everything's going to be okay in this other place. And at the end, when he goes and he, you know, he he goes down and he's lowered into the hole, Mm -hmm. he thinks what's going to happen is he's just going to be sent back to Penny in the other place. And and he's really upset when that realizes that's not the case. So I I just think he's decided none of this is, I think he even says it when none of this is real. Like, don't you understand? This doesn't matter. Yeah. That's interesting. And so instead of being outraged that Widmore has taken away from taken him away from Penny and Charlie. He knows that Penny and Charlie exist somewhere out there and he can access it. Yeah. And sadly yeah. he's wrong. I mean this is all real and it does matter and he's gonna want right. to live out the rest of his life here and have a happy life with Desmond and Char- Penny and Charlie. Yeah. Um which hopefully does actually occur. Right. I also thought just one last thing before we we cut to the interview. Um I thought it was really interesting that this episode ended in the sideways yeah i think it's the first time we've seen that and to me it felt like the architecture of the show just saying that this is the center of the action now no i i I agree with you and just talking about the end of the episode by the way like that last scene between penny and desmond is such a sweet sweet scene i i love it so much is that the same stadium where desmond met jack totally and where penny then confronted desmond afterwards hundred percent yeah hundred percent. I love it. No, I, I love the way as, as she's walking away that she, she turns back and, and looks at him and kind of chuckles. And, and then he lets out this great deep breath and he goes, oh man, he's been holding his breath this whole time. He's so nervous. Yeah. And... What happened? Well, I shook your hand and then you fainted. I must have quite an effect on you. <laughs> I, I, you must have. Um, we're, we're just smiling, thinking just about smiling. how nice it is. Um, you know, I, I know you said one last thing, but two more quick notes from me here. Um, the moment at the, the very end when Desmond gets back into the limo with mm-hmm. Minkowski, who we haven't talked about, it was, I like that there was actually this payoff finally to the whole like creepy kind of Minkowski, like I can get you whatever you want or mm-hmm. need the whole episode. It's like, why is he like, what's this dude all about? And then to have it pay off with Desmond asking him for the manifest, I thought was a, I thought that just, that was a good payoff. Yeah. Um, and Fisher Stevens is always very good. Like he's. He plays that role well. Um, one other unrelated note, just realized, when they go back to the island um, before 
before cutting back to Desmond and Penny for the end, Saeed ambushes Widmore's team mm-hmm. and, you know, kills some people and he lets Zoe go. He shows her mercy when he could have killed her. And I would like to think that that is the show communicating to us, like... There's still something in there. Exactly. Despite what we've been telling you, you know, like, because I was thinking, like, why did he let her go? And like, oh, well, maybe maybe that little bit of Saeed is is still trying to rear its head in there after he spent some time away from the man in black. Anyway, we got got Ian Cusick. We sure do. We know him. We love him. Henry Ian Cusick, of course, played Desmond. We're going to talk this week about the filming of some of what we saw in Happily Ever After today. And yeah, and before uh, before we get into just quick note, if you haven't heard our first two conversations with him, uh, the first one I believe was at the very beginning, and then at the very end of season two when he's first introduced and makes his return. Then we had him and the great Sonia Walger together discussing the constant, so both uh, both worth going back and listening to. Um, but let's uh, let's get into it with Ian again right now. We are back for the third time with Henry and Cusick, uh, who of course played Desmond on Lost. Ian, thank you so much for, for being back here with us. Hi, guys. Of course. We've got to finish it, right? I, I started, so I will finish. Yes, and you, you couldn't see it, but when Rosie introduced Ian, he was waving excitedly at the camera, so I think he's <laughs> eager to, to talk uh, Lost with us. Uh, yeah, I want to see how much I remember. So. Yeah, so we're, we're on the last season. Uh, you know, it, uh, your story had kind of uh, seemed like it had almost wrapped up at the end of the previous season. Uh, you'd you'd been shot by Ben, but you'd survived. You and Penny were reunited. You said everything was going to be okay. Um, come season six, the f- what I wonder what what you knew about your role going into this season because you appear really briefly in the first episode when they're on Oceanic Eight One Five again. You're on the plane. You're talking to Jack, and then you're gone for like ten weeks. Yeah. So a couple of things happened in between. I tore my ACL and I had to have an operation and they were unsure. And I was also, when I got shot, I was like, am I coming back to the show? And then because they were wrapping it up, I remember getting a phone call and they're saying, well, come back to the show. We don't need you for the whole season. We just need you for seven episodes. And I was like, huh, okay. Uh, so there are a lot of things uh and and we don't need you at the start of the season. So even though that that little snippet of me on the plane with Jack, I think that was pretty early on. That was shot much later on. So I was only needed for seven episodes. That was my deal. So I was almost like a recurring. I was no longer a season uh, a regular in the, by that point. And because um, they said um, I think they were I think they were spending a lot of money on people coming back. You know, I think all of a sudden it was the end of the show. I kept hearing these comments about um, they're not going to give you any, any you know, when, when it's the end of a show, no one's going to give you more money to, you know, it's the end. So this is the budget. These are, the, these are all the people that we want back for the show. And I think they knew who they wanted back and these are their fees. So they were being kind of, um, I guess, clever with their, their spending, their budget. That's interesting. So so you knew you would be back, but you, uh, and, and the, and the you, your ACL healed by the time you had to come back, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I remember I was doing some scenes, uh, but yeah, like for example, actually in this episode, um, I thought it had healed f- fine. But I remember I had a, I had a stunt double. I was like, "There's no stunt. What? What? Why? Why do I have a stunt? Oh, for running down the stairs." And I was like, "Oh, oh, okay." I mean, I could do it, but we had a, I had a stunt double for me running down the stairs, That's just funny. in case my ACL would have, you know. So they were a bit more concerned about my ACL than I was. I see. I was like, Are you talking fine. about when you're in the hospital chasing, chasing? Exactly. Like okay. You've got a good memory. Yeah. I watched the episode yesterday, so. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. you got a good memory for yesterday. That's very good. The, I, I think the, the main thing going into this episode, this was, I'll tell you what my reaction as a, as a fan was, and I'm curious what it was like for you. When, when they finally bring you back, um, you're, you're, you're dragged unconscious back onto the island. Uh, you know, Widmore has brought you back there. He wakes you up and, and it's like, come on, really? Like Desmond went through so much to get off of this, you know, God darn island. And he was with Penny again and everything was fine. And now they've, they've dragged him back and he's stuck here. I don't know. It, it felt unfair and kind of cruel to me. I don't know. I don't know what you made of it, but I, I thought, really, this is what they're doing to Desmond again? Oh, is that how it opens? Is that how the, the episode opens up? Is that, yeah. is that the scene in the hospital where he says, you're back in the island and I smashed that thing on his head? That's that's right. That's the first thing. <laughs> right. And prior to that, where where prior to that, where had I been, or where did I think I'd been? 
you, you were just you were just home with Penny, as far as we know. They didn't talk about you all season, and then Widmore. I guess, yes, right. I was on the boat with Charlie. Of course, I yeah. was sailing the world. There was a, I was going to do my own spin off episode, my spin off series of, of uh, <laughs> Desmond and Penny sail the world, um, and then that's right. And then I wake up on the island, and yeah. um, and they're going to do like electromagnetic experiments on you. You have to stand in that like. Right. Yeah, they, yes, because I had, I had something special. Chamber thing, and yeah. And that's right, and do some screaming. So, yeah, that's right. Thank you for reminding me of that. You know, I'm just going to tell you what comes into my head immediately when I had n- n- no idea what was. I-, I never really did, but I just trusted the writers and thought, I can go with what they're saying. And this was the season, and these were the episodes where I started phoning them and annoying them and saying, I have no, I need to know the show's going to end. What, how do I end my character? You know, so I was, I was definitely phoning them and asking them a lot more questions. And in this episode, um, I remember Carlton saying to me, have you seen Michael Clayton, the movie with uh, George Clooney? I said, no. He said, watch that one. And that was it. I thought, what does he mean? So I had to watch George, that. So what I took from that, you know, you know, in, uh, in Michael Clayton, he's a, kind of like a dead lawyer. He never, ever smiles, yeah. except right at the end. So that's what I took from it. So I really wanted to play Desmond in this whole episode, kind of nothing, almost like dead, almost like if I was on Xanax or something. And then only at the end, when I see Penny in the stadium, maybe I'm jumping, but that was when the moment that I go, oh, and I smile for the first time. Like Charlie's just an irritant and, you know, I just wanted to play kind of dead. And lawyer-like. So you're thinking of the alternate reality timeline where you're sort of Charles Widmore's like right-hand man and Desmond gets to to have the scotch with him to celebrate like the closing of a deal or something. And he's sending you all over the city to go pick up Charlie. Yeah. And I think I, in my head, I wanted to play that. But Jack Bender, who directed it, and I think Jack was probably my favorite director of all of them, didn't really see it that way. So I remember like, he would say, why are you... Why aren't you smiling? Why aren't you just being just just play it like you would be Desmond? And I, I really wanted to have a different edge to it. So, oh, I, I just did a little another tidbit. Just I know we're jumping all over, but this is um, there's a scene with Faraday in, the, in that yeah. in that uh-huh. movie, in that episode, and that we shot twice because the first time we had to reshoot that because he couldn't do his ADR. I remember that. Um, what what is ADR? He, oh, uh, the when you I don't what does this stand for? Um, it's basically looping, but okay. ADR, what does it actually stand for? That's a very good question. Please write in, and the winner will get something really cool. <laughs> that's that's fine. Um, talking about your performance in this episode, I, it, the Xanax thing is interesting, because there's, there's all of these times when other characters tell you, like, Oh well, you know, I think Widmore is saying to like, oh well, you have everything, you have everything you want, you know, you're you're rich, you're successful, you travel the world, you know, and you know, you say that as well. You tell Charlie like, why would I need love? Basically, I, I've got everything here, and I don't know. It, it's interesting because it feels like, I mean, obviously, it feels like this isn't the Desmond that mm-hmm. we've all come to know and love because that Desmond is is all about you know love and purpose and you know being with with Penny no matter what. And here he's saying, oh, I don't need any of that. So it. I, I think what you were trying to bring to it of, of feeling kind of dead, you you do feel kind of dead when you say all that stuff. And I don't know if it's because we know the character so well or what you were doing with your performance, but every time you say that stuff, you're like, nah, like he he doesn't really mean this. Like deep down, he knows right. this is yeah, wrong. But, there's something wrong, yeah. But, but he can't, you know, he, he can't identify that. I don't know. Was, there was something very interesting about it. Carlson and Damon wrote it, I believe, that episode. And they always gave me great episodes. I have to say, I was, I was given some really plum... Plum uh, acting challenges. So, oh, that's the and that's is that the that's the the mirror. Everyone started looking in the mirror, right? In this season. Yeah, I don't know if you do in this episode, but there were lots. There is of a moment I look in the mirror. That's right. Yeah, I think there is. And that started out. And do you remember the episode on the ship when I looked in the mirror with Naveen? Yeah, I remember phoning Carlton and I said, "Hey, Carlton, um, because I was playing two different." looks one with really short hair and then one with a beard and long hair and I was time traveling and I said Carlton could I have a moment where I look in the mirror because even when I'm makeup and I'm looking at myself in the mirror the changes are so that's the first thing you'd notice you know if you were in a different time you'd go wow how I have long hair and a beard when I should be you know short hair and a soldier and um, I wanted to have that and I remember like pitching that to Jack and he said no it's a stupid idea 
<laughs> and then Carlton said, no, let's keep... And then they kept that in for the next, for the next season. That everyone had that moment of looking in the mirror and thinking, this reality, there's something wrong with this reality, I think. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that's the, the, first, the first moment of the season when Jack is on the airplane right before he talks to you. The, what he does, he goes to the bathroom and he looks in the mirror and he, he's looking at himself like something is wrong here. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, that, that, I mean, that sounds like you gave them that idea, so that's pretty neat. I think that idea, that carried on, I think, I don't know how many characters did that. You probably know better than I do, but uh, I think anyone who was jumping back and forth in the timelines yeah. had that idea of, of, of looking in the mirror, so... Yeah, I think I think the first t- time it happens for for Desmond in this episode is when Charlie crashes the car into the ocean and and your character sort of comes up for air and then dives down to try to get him out and then it flashes back to the season 3 finale uh cuz Charlie there's a moment where Charlie presses his hand to the window yeah. and it I think they actually pull the the clip from season 3. They so did. it's not quite looking in the mirror right. but it is sort of this Callback That's too. the first time that first time Desmond is um, he wakes up or yeah. he sees that other life, which is a great idea. I think of that often. I always like you know I don't know if I'm I'm a big uh, believer in alternate realities and think you know dreams and sometimes you you know you think did that is that happening in the other reality that when I just visited and you know so I love all that stuff. I, so I really I it was, that was a great idea of. That there's an alternate reality where I'm super successful and very, very unhappy. <laughs> well, it's funny, though, because you, I mean, you get a very special role in the last season. I mean, you, you then appear throughout all of the other ones after this, like going around actively trying to wake people up. That's right. Um, yeah. and, and it's, I mean, it's, nobody else could do that, but Desmond gets to do that. that I, I imagine that must have been fun or at least interesting to play to go through all those other stories like that. At the time, not, with hindsight, we know there was an alternate reality, but we weren't allowed to use the term alternate reality, I think, because mm. Fringe was doing it at the time. Yeah. And we had crossover producers. I think, I think Jeff Finkner was like... Yeah, Fringe was another J.J. Abrams show, so that makes sense. Yeah, but Jeff, was, who was on Lost Early and was on, and then went to that show, and he was like, hey, you can't use the alternate reality because we've got that on Fringe. <laughs> and, I, that's, and this is in hindsight, because at, at the time I was thinking, why can't we just say it's an alternate reality? He said, no, you can't call it that. It's... It's the sideways. I was like, okay, it's alternate reality. <laughs> really? I remember the final season just being very, very... I was very unclear, very unclear on, on, on my... That, when, it, when you say it like that, of course, it's, it's obvious in that, this episode that I'm, I'm going to do that. But I'm, I think after this episode, I became a bit muddled about what I was doing. Yeah, well, he Desmond sort of goes about waking people up in very different ways. There's like a, a point where you approach Hurley in a restaurant God, and have like now. a pretty like normal conversation, but then either in that episode or, or very soon thereafter, you like hit John Locke with your car. Like it's it, it takes a lot of different. It's forms. a bit extreme, and, and then I and then I I punch poor Michael Emerson in the face for real. <laughs> To wake him up, I think I how else I'll just have to hit you repeatedly. Wake up, that'll this will work. Yeah, I don't. I don't um, think it worked. I don't think that's what woke him up. <laughs> that, didn't um, it? Didn't I? I, I, I you you definitely. Uh, no, beat no, him no, up. no, no, no. I didn't. No, I, no, I, no, I, I beat him up. I guess I remember that particularly because I actually hit him by accident and um, gave him a big black eye, and I was like, "What?" It was difficult to know at the time because he had so much blood on his face. It, he told us yeah. that story. It's a great, yeah. it's a great story. Yeah. Well, I, you know, it's funny though. If so, if, if you didn't know what was really going, because they they don't reveal till like the last scene of the whole season that okay, this is like the afterlife and everybody has died and it's time to move on. So you, I mean, it seems like you didn't know that when you were filming. No, we scenes. didn't. I remember speaking to Damon and Carlton saying, "I need to." What, uh, and towards really towards the end, pitching it, and they just would not say. Hmm. And I said, I just need to know what what I, where I'm going to pitch this. To, I need to do my job. Prior to that, I could just do it like a pin to play. I think I've had this conversation with you before, where I could just go, well, it's this is my interpretation of it. But if, if there's a definite ending, then I need to. I do. There's a there's, there comes a point where you do need to know. When do I get thrown down the well? The next episode, and this episode and, ends with Saeed sort of coming to. To kidnap you, more or less. But yeah, then then the week after, maybe the week after that, uh, Terry O'Quinn tosses you down the well. Yeah, that's when I got very very confused. I was like, "What's going on?" <laughs> I was like, "I don't I don't I don't know what's going on anymore." 
that's when I was like a little bit lost. Yeah. Is that when they finally told you a little bit about what was happening? No, that's when I had to phone them and say, what am I doing? <laughs> The well I think this was, this was the memory. That's right. This episode, I knew what I was doing. It was later on that I became really, really... Um, okay. It was very unclear. So well, let's just stick with this episode if you guys want to talk about this. Yeah, episode. yeah, yeah. For, for what okay. it's worth, whatever you did later, it worked. <laughs> this episode, I mean, this episode has a lot of great scenes. You got the scenes, you, you got the scenes with Dominic, obviously. Um, you've got scenes with, uh, more scenes with Fionnula Flanagan playing, you know, little Miss Hawking, you know, trying to scare you off again. You've got the scene with, with Jeremy Davies, um... I mean, yeah. if anything, if anything comes to mind, let us know. But I, I'm curious about the scenes with with Dominic, especially where he drives into the water and and you have to pull him out. I'm, I guess I'm curious about what that was like, and and also just what it was like working with him again because he'd been gone for a while. That's right. Um, I remember that day particularly because of the stunt, and um, the stunt guy Mike Trisler did the driving. And for some reason, I remember people saying, he doesn't need to do the driving. He just wants to do the driving because you could have just had the car just fly into the, into the water, but he wanted to do it. And when it did happen, and these, are, these days are always they're kind of exciting, you know, we, we, as actors, we just sit around and take video of it. And he, he did it and he went in and he didn't appear for a good two minutes where people started standing up going, what's going on? And that water is really nasty in the, at the, um, by the... Um, but anyway, the Hawaii, Hawaii Yacht Club. That water's really dirty, dark, you can't see anything. But it was pretty scary for a moment. Like, is he going to make it out of there? And he couldn't find his way out. It was too dark. He was um, disorientated because he was upside down and he managed to get out. And he got taken to hospital. He had a few cuts and bruises and stuff. But that was pretty. That was a pretty scary day. Um, and then the other stuff, you know, doing that stuff with Dominic, it was just, I, I really enjoyed that we were... You know, I thought that was um, that was some really cool stuff we had to do. I thought it came up it worked well. I just like two people chatting at a bar, you know. But um, oh, that's right. And then we had all the underwater stuff, yeah. which I love doing. Uh, Dominic is pretty incredible under the water. He just stayed the whole time. He never came up. I didn't realize that he is like he had done a lot of uh, scuba diving. Mm-hmm. So when I was coming up and down uh, after each take. He would just stay there with his regulator sitting in the car, just wow. chilling out. Yeah. And I'd be like, no, nah, I'm getting out. Uh, we were in a pool. We were in a, in a, in a tank. And, and maybe he was wise because every time you go up and down, it affects your ears. So at the end of the day, my ears were just throbbing. It was only about 12 feet, but even so. Um, but I love doing all that stuff. That's very exciting. I, I really enjoy doing the action stuff. Um, Fanula, Fanula Flanagan, just yes. a joy to work with. Uh, I had done a little bit before with her, but she is just a treat. I really liked that lady, and she was just delightful to work with. Oh, I was just going to say we we, and I apologize because I realized after you said it that I mispronounced your name, Fanula. But we had we had her on the podcast a year or two ago, and she's lo- lovely, lovely person. Obviously, nothing like her intimidating character, but it just it seems no, like it would be fun to sweet. work with her when she's Super uh, sweet. you know she's all all threatening and kind of haughty with you and telling you, oh, don't don't pursue this, don't find Penny, whatever you do, you know this is. This is not your... Pa- and unlike the first time when she tells you that years and years ago, when you listen to her, this time you basically tell her, you know, screw off, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. I always like working with people like Fanula or Alan Dale, because they'd come in with a different energy and they were like, what's going on? I have no idea. <laughs> you know, and then I have to explain to them what's going on. They go, okay, all right, that, okay, all right, whatever. Do you think that, all right. Um, so and they had that, they had just brought a different energy to the whole, you know, it's always nice when people come with that kind of like lighthearted, oh, we're having fun energy. Um, I took it super seriously, you know, for me, I would wake up in the morning, I was Desmond in the morning, Desmond last thing at night, it would came, I was all obsessed with this character. Um, so, and uh, Fanula, we, we knew a lot of people common, in common back from, from Britain. And, you know, so um, it was always nice just to catch up on stuff like that. And then Jeremy, um, Jeremy's such a, a brilliant and unique actor um, that I just love watching him. Um, but he mumbles so much and he never does the same thing twice. Um, so that was the thing. Jeremy, we did that scene. <laughs> we shot it once. And because he just goes off and he sort of mumbles and he repeats his lines and he goes off and things. And they tried to, um, the sound was terrible. So they had to, re- so they, they said, you have to come in and do the sound and match it, loop it. And he couldn't do it because he's so, it's, 
it's, his style of acting is so unpredictable that he couldn't do it. So we had to reshoot the scene again. Uh, and then we shot it in the garden. And uh, yeah, and I, and I think it worked. I think it worked fine. Um, and who else did I work with? And Sonia. Sonia turned up at the end. Who's always the delight, always brings in that fresh. Like, what's happening? <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> yeah, so, it's, and it's yeah. fun to watch the two of you as if you've never met before, as well. When you have all yeah. that history, and for for her to be like, "Who are you? And what are you doing here?" Um, <laughs> that was that was nifty. Yeah, no, she's always a, a treat, you know. So, yeah, yeah it's a uh, it was a good episode. Now you know you're, you're reminding me, and I got a, I got some really nice scenes to do, with, and they're all great actors and. If I were to remember anything, I really enjoyed the, the bar scenes with Dominic. I thought they turned out really well. Just two people chatting in a bar, you know. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're really, they come off as really, like, sort of profound. Like, I guess, well, I guess Charlie has sort of already been enlightened. Because he has kind of this near-death experience on the plane. And that's why he's... In, in jail. Yeah, yeah. He, tells you, he tells you the story that he was swallowing the heroin and he was choking to death and then he saw a vision of, of Claire, the woman that he was with. And so he, he kind of gets it already. Yeah. So he's sort of waking you up. So he really, he could have done what I did because he woke me up. Yeah. And then I go around waking everyone up. So he could have, oh, but he's already dead in, the, in this, in this, in our world. That's yeah. right. He, and the others, who, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And, and also so he's he not can't particularly responsible about it. I mean, he's, you know, going off to, to to do more drugs and get real wasted and and you're you're thinking oh, oh, I know, oh I, yeah wait a second is the charlie is, so charlie's accepting his life in the alternative reality thinking this is kind of cool you know say my life well you know it was only because my something was missing from that alternative reality but if charlie's life was i get to be a pop star take drugs and have my life is great then you wouldn't want to change your reality you, you want you would want to stay in that that which is but but what is but which is real? But what is it? How is one more real than the other? But but here but here's but then again let's go back to Desmond for a second. I don't think this other Desmond in this alternate reality. I mean, he he never would have been happy. I think that's the point here. You know, maybe he didn't meet Penny. He, he had Widmore's respect, right? That was the whole thing. This episode. Um, that's what Fanula says to you. It's like you have. Why are you trying to mess this up? You have the thing that you always wanted, which was my husband's respect. Um, which is a thing for sure that in you know real life Desmond had always wanted. He he, he asked for Widmore's permission. He could never get it. He wasn't good enough for his whiskey. And and here Widmore is offering him his whiskey. But clearly it's not enough for you. I don't I don't think any of these other alternate Desmonds would have been happy without Penny in his life, even if he had all of this other stuff. Um, Maybe I'm wrong, but that's my no. That's my I, no, I, I think you know. I, I think because it's a TV show, we could only show two realities or two 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 timelines. But there must be, if we were going to do the show properly, a million of these timelines and all different intersections and where they, they jump off. So there may well have been a one of those where Widmore, he has Widmore's respect and he's also in love with Penny. Maybe. I might, I might have strung the show for you guys. <laughs> so one thought I have after listening back to this interview, why couldn't Carlton and Damon just tell him what was going on? Like... Not that he doesn't do a great job of it anyway, but would it, would it really have killed them to to let Ian in, given his crucial role in pulling this season together? Like it's it's just interesting to me that they made that choice to let him do it blind rather than rather than giving him some notes. I mean, they gave him the Michael Clayton note, which I think is very <laughs> effective. No, he he does a great job. His whole description, yeah, de- dead and lawyerly, and I, I love that he and, and Bender were arguing about it and disagreeing. Um, which by the way is, I think another argument for probably why Damon and Carlton should have had a conversation with, with Ian and maybe even with Bender. Like, I don't know, they, they, it works, but they may have gotten a little lucky that it works so well. Anyway, we'll, uh, we'll have more from Ian, uh, next week as we, uh, as we continue with season six. That's right. Next week we are watching Everybody Loves Hugo. Uh, we're finally going to get to see what Hurley gets up to in the flash sideways. Yeah, we didn't talk about it, but we had a great little glimpse of Hurley this week in the airport, being his usual kind, uh, kind, loving self, You're recognizing right. that uh, Desmond was on the plane and maybe needs some help finding the baggage. That was a nice moment, but we'll, we'll get into Hurley next week. As Sammy mentioned, you are more than welcome to call and leave us your hot take about Everybody Loves Hugo or any other episode, really. Uh, 9546 Dharma. If you are outside the U.S., use the country code 1 before you dial. 
Come chat with us on social media, too. We're on Twitter at The Hatch Podcast, Facebook.com slash The Hatch Podcast. We love to hear from you. If you like the show and want to rate and review us on the podcast app of your choice, we'd appreciate that, too. Our theme music is by Andy G. Cohen. Our cover art is by Danny Roth. We'll see you next time. Namaste. Namaste.